Good morning, and thank you for coming. Naveen, welcome. Oh, thank you, Jemima. So, you've done a lot of things. You've had a lot of businesses, a lot of companies. Why did you start doing the moon? Well, I think the moon to me is really symbolic of what we as entrepreneurs and humans are capable of doing. Because, you know, moon has always been thought of something that only the superpowers could go and do. What if you can show people that a small group of committed people can go and land on the moon and become the fourth superpower that has never been done before? And once you can show people what is possible, they will, do, they will go out and maybe land on the Mars. Maybe they'll go land on the Venus and maybe we'll conquer the galaxy. Who knows what we will do? Space is often a really deeply personal mission that has driven the entrepreneurs that work in that space since they were children. Is that true of you? Well, to me, it wasn't about really growing up wanting to be a space cadet. To me, everyone, when you start a company and the first thing you go out and assemble your team and what you say, we are going to go to the moon, we are going to go to the moon. So one day I say, you know what, let's just go to the moon and done with it, right? <laughs> and then we'll start the next company. Okay, so why you then? Why are you the best person to sort this mission to the stars? Because I think I am the most dangerous person that space exploration has ever seen because I know nothing about space. And most incremental solution comes from the people who are experts in the field. So experts are very good at doing something that's 10% better or 15% better. But you need complete non-expert who doesn't know what, to say, what don't, not to do is what you get 10x and 15x improvement. And that's why you see Elon Musk and you see Jeb Bezos and you see Richard Branson and you see Naveen Jain doing these things because we are absolutely non-experts. So you're a moonshot in yourself, is that what you're saying? Uh, well, I'm saying is I think moonshot. I am not a moonshot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and if that wasn't ambitious enough, you've now got a new project called Blue Dot. Yes. Tell us about that. Yes, so the blue dot is actually my way of looking at the things. What are the biggest problems facing humanity? Whether it is uh, health care, whether it is uh, wat water scarcity, whether it is food. And we look at the stuff and saying we are living in a decade of the most innovative dec decade in the human history. In the next 10 years, we'll fundamentally change the way and the trajectory of how humanity lives. We'll be able to reprogram our own human body. So imagine our software of our body has not been upgraded for millions of years. And we can't live without an upgrade on our cell phone for more than a year. So think about that. What if we are able to reprogram our body not to store fat? Because that's just a bug in our software that was designed originally when we used to eat every three, four days. Uh, every three, four days. Now we eat three or four times a day. What's the reason for us to be storing the food? Just because I had a big lunch doesn't mean I'm not going to have a big dinner or even a bigger uh, 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 <clears throat> a d dessert after that. So point is, you can fundamentally change the, you know, the way we live. And we have to change the mindset. Our mindset has actually become that of a scarcity rather than the mindset of abundance. In fact, in many of the developed countries, when we talk about sustainability, it has become a synonym for conservation. That means use less of what we have. And I tell people, you can never ever grow by saving, you grow by making more. So if you want to create abundance, create more of what we need, more land. If you're fighting over land, let's go figure out how to live on the moon, how to live on the Mars. If you're fighting over water, let's create abundance of fresh water. And we can, you know, we can create abundance of energy because we're living on a planet that's bathed in solar energy 10,000 times more than we use. And people say, but it's, it is not efficient. We can't do it. It costs too much. It is the same argument that people made uh, you know, hundreds of years ago. Do you know what the most precious metal was? It wasn't the platinum. It wasn't gold. It was aluminum. In fact, the top of the Washington Monument is the aluminum because it was the most precious metal. In fact, <coughs> Napoleon, when he hosted a dinner for King of Siam, he wanted to impress him. You know what he did? He fed all his uh, executives in a gold platter, his troops in a silver platter, but the King of Siam was served in an aluminum platter. That was the, his way of saying, I respect you. You know why it was rare? There is a tremendous amount of aluminum on planet Earth, but it's not in a pure quantity. It's always mixed with, uh, you know, it's called bauxite until we developed the technology called electrolyte, and suddenly it became abundant. So same thing when you talk about going to the moon is impossible, it's too hard. What if 
it changed. What if we can have, as you are starting to see, the reusable rockets, solid state rockets, and you're able to go there on a weekend, and what if the honeymoon really becomes taking your honey to the moon, and actually, really, seriously, it's not called honey Hawaii, it's called honeymoon, right? <laughs> what if you're... <laughs> let, let's, let's go back a step or two. Um, to... Um, how Blue Dot will work as a company. So Blue Dot actually has a very interesting business model. What I realize is that every single year in the developed countries, we're spending 500 billion, that's with a B, every single year. And there are millions of scientists who are working at the national labs, at NASA and universities for 10, 20 years building this research. And I started to look at this research and I say, oh my God, what if this research can be applied for changing for the benefit of humanity? So imagine I saw a spray on a, that you can spray on a Kleenex and as you sneeze, it can tell you whether you have a flu or a common cold, whether you have a bacterial infection or a viral infection. Imagine if we can reduce the use of antibiotics knowing that you have a bacterial infection or you have a viral infection. What if you're able to diagnose all the common diseases is better than a doctor? What if you are able to change what you actually do based on what you eat? Because the microbiome itself, your gut bacteria, is what controls whether you are going to have Alzheimer, whether you're depression, anxiety, and a lot of the things in your body is actually controlled by microbiome, your bacteria in your gut. So when we are so proud of ourselves, we don't realize we are simply a host for parasites. 90% of our cells in our body are nothing but bacterial cells. So don't be so proud, you're simply a host for parasites. So of all these disparate research projects, how does Blue Dot start working with those people? Do you buy the IP? Do you so buy it's very the interesting, and I think all of you should do that. This is a totally wonderful business model. The, it is a taxpayer money that's being used for the research. You can go to any of the national labs on NASA, and you have a right to be able to see what they're doing, and right to be able to get an exclusive license for that technology that you can build a company around. So imagine they have spent $10 billion building a portable x-ray machine, and now you can go out and build a business out of it, and it's yours to have, and you pay them a very small royalty. So think about, you can go out and find these amazing research where they've spent $10 billion already building the product, and you go to go build the company. Not only you help billions of people around the world, that's doing good, and you create a $10 billion company in the process, that's doing well. Presumably it takes quite a lot of money to bring that product to market or to, to put more time and energy and resource into developing that project further. So how many projects do you have ongoing and how much money do you put into those? It's very interesting. That actually does not require a lot because what happens is these people are continuing to work on it and it takes to productize something may cost you anywhere between you know, a couple of hundred thousand dollars to maybe a couple of million dollars. So it's really not a lot of investment. And what I do is specifically is I work with them to create the prototype and I pay them to say, show me that you can actually use the Hubble telescope UV sensor to detect cancer or to detect a bacterial infection. And if you can do that, I will license it. And it may cost you a couple of hundred thousand dollars to for them, have them build a prototype that you specifically want them to do. And then you license the IP and then you essentially hire a team to go out and pursue the market. But at that point, you know the product is ready. Because once the product is ready, you don't need an entrepreneur, you need a great manager. And you can hire a bunch of great managers from a mid-level managers from a bunch of large companies and have them build the company. So how many projects do you have ongoing? So we are currently have five different projects that we are working on. Uh, most, most of them are actually in the wireless transfer of energy. Uh, some very, very clever way of you can transfer the energy so you can have your pacemaker, your cell phone, your wristwatch, or any of the embeddable devices that are going to be inside your body. So imagine the nanobots. You know, we talk about changing the way we live. What if you, uh, you can create the nanobots which are like your blood cells and they're constantly roving in your body, re removing all the cancer cells, removing all the diseases, at the same time also supplying you with the oxygen. So when your heart stops working, you don't go out and die. You simply take a nice shower, you go call your doctor and say, hey doc, my heart stopped working, would you mind printing me a new heart? I'll be there in 30 minutes. Right? And now you can actually go out and build, you know, 3D print your own organs. You can print your own liver. So don't worry about drinking tonight. Drink as much as you want. You always have a new liver waiting for you. I think that was last <laughs> night, but never mind. Um, so uh, of, of all these, these projects, it seems like um, 
it's hard to work out whether you find an interesting technology and then you see what problem you can solve with that, or whether you have a kind of a list of the world's biggest problems sure. and then you try and find a Absolutely. technology that can solve it that. It is How always the second thing. What you do is you look at and see what are the biggest problems facing humanity. Okay, so what and, are the biggest problems? I will come back to in a second. But it is the reason you do that is not because you are simply a philanthropist, because the biggest problems are the biggest opportunity for, for an entrepreneur. If you can help a billion people, you can create a $10 billion company. There is no two ways about it. So what are the biggest problems? So if you think about lack of fresh water, and you say, why do we have a lack of fresh water when we're living on a planet that's 70% water? But he said, but it's all salty water. But imagine where the fresh water goes. Fresh water is used for agriculture. What if we can change agriculture to be aeroponic or hydroponic or change the seeds to use lightly salted water? We can have abundance of water. But you take a step further and you think majority of the agriculture is used to feed the cattle. And what if we are able to create the beef without ever having to raise the cattle, simply taking a stem cell from a cow and create a muscle tissue, then you can now have bio factories of beef without ever having to have a cattle. So imagine, suddenly a fresh water problem becomes a synthetic biology problem. And if you solve that, imagine what's happening. You're also helping the environment because the biggest damage to the environment is being caused by the uh, cattle with the methane, which causes the uh, depletion of the ozone layer and the carbon dioxide. So what if you solve that? So if you really care about the environment, don't drive Tesla, just don't eat meat once a week. And that will do more for the environment than you will ever do driving Tesla. So don't feel good about driving Tesla. I drive Ferrari, but you know what? I'm a vegetarian, so I'm da I feel damn good. <laughs> I'm also 40 years vegetarian, um, so yeah, sorry New Orleans, that didn't really work out. But, um. but continuing the thing, so lack of fresh water, lack of health care. I mean, imagine that we have these doctors that go to college for six, seven years and they do the internship, and by the time they come out of the internship, they're already obsolete because the technology is moving so fast, the doctor has no idea what is going on. In fact, there is more research being done every single day than a human being can read in 24 hours. So in fact, the sensors are becoming so powerful and they're becoming so cheap, today you can have a cell phone that can diagnose the common diseases, it can diagnose the heart diseases, it can diagnose most things, in fact, it can diagnose the cancer with a better AI, better than any radio radiologist ever. In fact, we have proven time and time again, humans make more mistakes than computers will do if you give them the right set of sensors and right AI. So healthcare is absolutely ripe for disruption. So healthcare diagnostic will completely get disrupted in the next five to 10 years. Genetics will completely disrupt the way we live and it's gonna change everything because you'll be able to change not only how our human body performs, but you know, someday we might able to in fact do the head transplant so imagine this already being done where people are able to take one head and put them in another body. So let someone else do a better workout and you can always have a great body later, right? <clears throat> so you don't even have to work out someday. Right? You're, you're clearly very ambitious uh, and have interests in a huge number of areas. How do you make sure that you stay focused? So the if, way, if you try to do too many things in too many areas, yeah. so I, it's not going to work. So the way you stay, as an entrepreneur, I'm a big believer that most entrepreneurs and most companies die out of indigestion rather than starvation. Trying to do so many things together at the same time is what kills company. So I don't do so many things. What I do is I start one project, I nurture it when it's ready. I hire the whole team. So for example, at Moon Express, I worked for the three, four years. Now I have a CEO and a whole team that's running it. And I move on to the executive chairman where my job is to simply provide advice. And then I move on to the next project. And the next project, I'm focused on that. As soon as that's ready, I hire a whole team and let it go. And then, hire, then I build the next. But while I'm doing it, there, these projects are actually laddered. So some things are going to be ready in one year. Some are going to be ready in two years. Some are going to be in three years, and some are five or 10 years project. And by laddering them, I'm able to essentially focus on each project when they are ready, and essentially able to give it to someone who can go out and continue to build them. And to me, the best leverage I have is to be able to see what needs to be done, create an amazing team, and give them the resources they need to be able to do their job. With, with that in mind, what are you most proud of? 
I'm most proud of being an entrepreneur. To me, there is no better way of giving back to the society than being an entrepreneur. Everyone else can whine and give you the problems, or people can come up with, I have an idea, but the only one who goes out and solves a problem is an entrepreneur. So if you ask me what I'm most proud of, every entrepreneur I meet, my hat's off to them, I love them and I'll do anything for them because they are the one who are changing the society. Anyone who comes and says, this is a crazy idea, to me, that's the guy who's gonna change the world. Because if you're not thinking so big that people think you're crazy, Either your idea is too small or you just happen to be crazy. In that case, all bets are off. And the flip side to that question is what are you least proud of? What I'm least proud of is actually not, not being an entrepreneur when I was young. I started my entrepreneurial journey when I was in my 30s rather than my 20s. So I am just so proud of my, uh, my kids who started their entrepreneurial journey. And by the time I even, when I even knew what I was doing, they not only started, my oldest not only started the company, he sold the company already. So I'm thinking, what was I doing when I was 20 years old? <laughs> And looking ahead, yeah. and I know you have many pots on the boil, but looking ahead, which um, technology or trend or company, apart from your own, mm. excites you the most? So I really think if you look at the things, I focus more on what are the biggest changes that you're going to see. So I see the artificial intelligence will fundamentally change a lot of different things. And the problem with the artificial intelligence is the day it starts working, people start, people start to take it for granted. Oh, it's no longer in artificial intelligence. For example, when we fly a plane, Pilots don't fly the plane, it's the artificial intelligence that actually flies the plane. And people are today so scared of autonomous cars. It is going to happen just like we fly the, the AI flies the plane, we'll be flying the car, we essentially will be driving the car. You look at your dishwasher, dishwasher is an AI, it's a robotic AI. But now we take it for granted. The same things will start to happen. So I really think the artificial intelligence companies like Vicarious, uh, and there are several other great companies who are really doing some amazing stuff in AI that I think will be very, very exciting. I think the AR, the augmented reality, is going to be another big, big change in terms of how we perceive reality. Because our brain is never designed to have things that are created that don't exist in the physical world. And only the reason I know this bottle of water exists is because somehow this bottle of water is sending the photons to my retina and it goes to my visual cortex and it goes through V1, V2, V3, V4 and we realize that thing is a bottle of water. What if I was wearing the glasses and the glasses itself intercepted the light and created the water bottle? My brain doesn't know the water bottle exists or I created it artificially. So imagine that, that what would you do? Suddenly, when we are talking about a project, you and I could be looking at something that doesn't exist here, we can be able to explain it. We are able to walk down on a China, Chinatown and see every sign being in English rather than being in Chinese. Suddenly, we are able to, in fact, mix the reality between physical and virtual and everything changes. So what's real and what's not real? The whole idea of having the screen goes away. Why would you need to have a cell phone or iPad or a TV? when you can create it when you need it. So if I need a text message, my screen pops up in front of me. I need a bigger screen TV, it pops up in front of me. So suddenly all the things that we are used to changes because we are able to mix the reality between artificial and uh, reality. So I think healthcare will, the healthcare diagnostic will completely get disrupted. Genetics will completely disrupt everything. 3D printing and robotics will completely disrupt the supply chain. It will disrupt the way we do things. That means we can go to space and build things in space rather than carrying every part from here. A space station doesn't need to take all the spare parts because we can print the parts that we need right in space itself. We can print the whole humanity uh, and DNA of humanity. We can teleport ourselves doing the DNA synthesis. We can in fact transfer our mind, our body into a different location and suddenly we can be teleported. So beam me up, Scotty. <laughs> Naveen promised me before this session started that there wouldn't be a moment of silence, and I think he has fulfilled his brief. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Jemima, and thank you very much.